but I'm sorry for that. There we go. Perfect. So thank you for inviting me to speak here. And um, I'm really excited. And thank you, Johanna, for an excellent and exciting presentation, which also I think ties pretty well into what I'm going to talk about, which is uh, mainly these coastal resident pikes in um, along the Swedish coast. Um, Yeah, I'm trying to change the slide here and failing. There we go. Um, you have heard this throughout this, uh, this symposium that um, pike is declining in, uh, in coastal waters in the Baltic Sea, especially in the Baltic proper, where all, all test fishery we do uh, at SLU shows negative trends for pike and also some in the Bothnian Bay. I wanted to include that because from the declining population here, we actually have samples for the genetic study that I'm gonna talk about later. And what this uh, means in reality is that we have more isolated populations now due to um, loss of habitat. And uh, that could potentially have, uh, have, have an effect on, on also on genetic patterns. And I will repeat here now a little bit about what Johanna already talked about, uh, about the previous studies of, uh, uh, of pike in the Baltic Sea and uh, uncertainties or shortcomings of these that we hope that we have addressed in, in the results that I will present later. So first I want to show you some results of a study that is now, now 15 years old, looking at pike uh, in a large scale over the Baltic Sea, using only five microsatellite markers, so not very informative markers. But in this study, um, the authors found isolation by distance among these, uh, um, uh, these populations, not a very strong genetic clustering, which, of course, as Johanna already mentioned, could be either due to that there's a fairly high gene flow between the populations, but um, it can also be an effect of a non-informative genetic marker. Um, here, the authors also suggested a, a management unit of about 100 kilometers, and we'll see if we agree with that um, with newer results. Uh, during my PhD, I also studied pike in the same, pretty much follow-up study on this previous um, large-scale Baltic, Baltic study. Uh, also using microsatellite markers, more markers, but still it's always a low number. <laughs> it's, 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 it will always be low resolution of the entire genome when you use microsatellite markers. Um, some, some things that I want to point out uh, from this study is um, also this the same as what I mentioned before, a fairly low uh, degree of uh, differentiation among different samples. Again, is that because of uh, hygiene flow or is it because of uh, non-informative markers? It, impossible to say. Um, in this study, we also had uh, samples both from uh, taken during spring so close to spawning although couldn't couldn't say for sure that it's actually spawning pike uh, but at least uh, at least sampled close to spawning and also samples uh, fall samples um, and it was clear that the genetic differentiation among populations was higher uh, in spring closer to spawning than in uh, in fall, which could indicate that there's also in these coastal populations, there is some homing increasing the differentiation uh, around spawning time and then some mixing in, in the, uh, during other parts of the year. Uh, which also confirms 
um, the two major uh, uncertainties in these previous studies that we both use markers that we know are uh, not very infor informative and I think Johanna showed very clearly that that suspicion is also correct that microsatellites do not have high enough uh, re resolution to really differentiate between uh, pike populations. Pike is also notoriously known for having a very low level of genetic variation which uh, further <laughs> complicates things because it's difficult to find differentiation when the when the variations you have to work with from the start is is very low um, and also the issue of uh, have we been sampling spawning populations here are we looking at patterns uh, of actual populations or are we looking at mixed mixed population samples from a separate spawning populations that are mixing um, at other times of the year. Um, the, the results that I will present now is has been um, the samples have been taken in uh, in the Refisk uh, project which was coordinated by Landstyrelsen in Stockholm's land. Uh, the county administrative board um, and the goal of this project was to revise the fishing regulations uh, along the east coast uh, and, some, and we this, the spots that were studied in in the whole program was many more than we have genetic samples from but we have a large uh, a fairly large number of populations uh, for which we could also sequence genetically. Uh, and the sampling scheme here was it was done by Rod and Reel uh, in known spawning areas at known spawning times. So we think we are fairly certain that we are actually targeting spawning individuals here. Um, 16 populations in total. Most of them are resident uh, coastal populations, so they are both uh, feeding and spawning in coastal waters and coastal bays. We have two, uh, two populations that I want to point out specifically, which is one here, Svenska Högarna, which is a sample from a population very far out in the archipelago, also where the declines in, in pike was um, has been biggest and earliest. And we all have one sample here from Hemesta, which is an anadromous population. So it's uh, very much a, a, an opposite sampling scheme from what Johanna was showing. Uh, I don't need to go into the details why we chose RAD sequencing, since Johanna gave such an excellent uh, background to that, but to um, it, it is obvious that, that a more uh, informative uh, genetic method is, is needed and something that covers more of the genome. And we also chose RAD sequencing, which, is, which uh, does give a lot more information than uh, microsatellite markers. Um, here I'm going to focus on neutral genetic variation uh, based on a little bit over 2000 SNPs. That's not a huge number of SNPs, but they are um, present in almost all of the samples. Uh, and the main, the first result I want to point out here is an overall FST value of 3%. And if you remember Johanna's presentation, that is much lower than for the mainly anadromous populations. This is this FST value is a little bit higher, but in the same ballpark as was previously shown with microsatellites for um, Baltic Sea pike populations. It's quite a lot of variation. And I also want to uh, stress here that all, also here, all, all the samples are significantly differentiated. So even at very small geographic distances, there is significant genetic differentiation uh, among populations, which indicates that they are indeed separate, even if, the, if, even if the level of differentiation is lower in these coastal resident populations than in, uh, in the anadromous that Johanna was talking about. 
uh, if we do a PCA over these pop these populations, this um, uh, we also see that it it is a um, there is a separation uh, among samples, but it's also quite a big overlap. Um, they they don't form these. Uh, completely separate clusters in a PCA. Uh, some populations are uh, are more diverged from from uh, others. Uh, this figure becomes a little bit more clear, I think, if you flip it around and show it together with a map. Uh, and here you can see that most population. It's actually a pretty remarkable. <laughs> a pretty remarkable reflection of geography in this uh, in this PCA. Uh, and here we can also see point out these two uh, populations that are uh, clustering together are um, Svenska Högarna, this outer archipelago population, and also the freshwater spawning, the anadromous from Hemesta. Uh, are clustering separately from all the coastal population populations. Uh, so even if we do have a, um, we have a large overlap uh, among the coastal populations. We also see that it is, it is indeed some separations that the northern populations are clustering together, and they are separate from the from the most southernmost samples. Uh, I want to go on a little bit and talk about isolation by distance, which was a very clear pattern in the earlier studies. Um, isolation by distance is a, a pattern that is very common in nature. It occurs when migration or gene flow is primarily happening among uh, neighboring populations. And on further distances, genetic drift is the more, um, more strong effect um, shaping the genetic diversity. Uh, you can also, of course, have systems where you have no, uh, no association between geographic distance and genetic distance. Um, for example, that populations are very differentiated from each other and genetic drift is the primarily, uh, primary factor shaping genetic variation. Or you can have systems with um, where there's a lot of gene flow and genetic drift is not as important. Or within a system, you can have uh, populations that uh, are mainly, mainly uh, agreeing to one pattern, but specific populations can diverge from the general pattern. Uh, and that is what I will show here. So this is just a graph of isolation by distance in the this total sample uh, of populations. Uh, there is a Definitely, definitely a correlation between geographic and genetic distance, uh, but there's also a lot of variation in this uh, data set, specifically populations that are um, have higher, are above the regression line, so to say, they have higher genetic differentiation than the overall. If we look at the residuals in this main uh, graph, um, we see that some populations do indeed show uh, a lot a lot higher genetic differentiation from from uh, than the average population uh, they are above the regression line and some populations are also show less differentiation than the uh, than most of the populations uh, but if you look at these, if we look at these regression models and compare them with uh, the Akaki information criteria, find the, the most informative model, we find that it is again these two populations, the outer archipelago population uh, and the freshwater spawning one that is um, uh, that has a different pattern than the rest of the populations. So if we ex exclude them from the regression model, uh, we actually have a very, very tight correlation between geographic distance and uh, genetic distance, uh, which does in indicate that there is some gene flow in the, in the system, but primarily on, on short distances. Um, and what could be the implications of these results? I, um, 
I want um, about the migration. We can't say for sure that is migration actually going on now. This can also reflect historic migration, or uh, which is possible. Uh, we can't tell a, a pattern from of current low levels of migration in short distances from a situation that we might previously have had a very continuously distributed pike populations over the whole coast, which is now um, due to habitat loss has uh, contracted into separate populations, uh, isolated islands that will drift apart uh, eventually. Um, I want to remind you again that uh, we did have significant genetic differentiation also among popula uh, between populations that are very close together. So I will, I will just concur with the previous speaker <laughs> that local management is, um, uh, should be a take home message here. Uh, and with that, I, uh, I want to thank I want to thank collaborators and people, people who have helped me in this study um, and funded the study, of course. And, uh, and thank you all for um, listening to me.